Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you everyone for hanging around. It's um, been a pretty good day, pretty long day here at the end of the day and we're going to talk about uh, designing cloud native applications and what we're going to look at today is um, what makes up a cloud native application and then right at the end we're going to look at a little bit of what Cisco is bringing to the, uh, the environment and to the microservices and the container world to assist with the deployment and the building of cloud native applications. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what is a cloud native application and things differ a little bit as we move into this cloud native and this multi-cloud world as we start to look at okay how can we distribute these systems across any cloud, any service running across you know whatever fits our governance or our um, cost reasons and start to look at how do we scale these systems out and build microservices around them. So what we want to be looking at is how do we build things that are self-contained but can scale across wide disparate systems, could be global, could be within a data center, could be across multiple clouds. So when we start to look at this, we start to build out and understand what is the framework that we're going to build these things within. So the essential characteristics that we want is the ability to do them on demand. We need these things to be able to be spun up by our developers who are building these things and constantly writing code, constantly tweaking and changing the underlying application that they're building, but also make them available for the end users. So self-service and on-demand capability is a, is a must, is an absolute requirement of a cloud native application. We start to look at how do we access them. So we need a wide range of network access. We need the ability that if we deploy these applications on AWS or Azure or a local open stack or a local VMware environment, to have a consistent network policy and a consistent access methodology so that the application is highly available and you know, accessible from anywhere around the world or anywhere within a region or from any mobile device or whatever access methodology that we're looking at. So what we end up with is a series of frameworks and a series of methods for building these things. So these get rolled up under the banner of a PaaS platform or IaaS or even Metal as a service, but we need this programmatic and available methodology to access and build these. We need the ability to build patterns and scale these things out to you know, a web scale application. When we look at the Googles, we look at the Facebooks and other applications that are these web scale applications. We want to be able to take that methodology that these guys have developed and incorporate that into our own application design. So traditionally when we look at an application, this is what we've been dealing with for you know, quite a long time. We shifted from bare metal to a virtualized world, but we didn't really change the underlying premise and the underlying um, architecture of the applications. So we've been dealing with this environment where we've had the monolithic, the large applications that sit across a single virtual machine or maybe a cluster of virtual machines. And we've ended up with you know, there's multiple VMs and many applications architecture. As we shift this into a cloud native world, we need to fundamentally change the way we look at virtual machines, but also how we look at the applications. Now, the interesting thing that you look at on this slide is that essentially what we've done with this architecture is we've decoupled the application or the virtual machine, the operating system, from the underlying hardware. So as we move into a cloud native world, we're incorporating a similar mindset where we're decoupling the application from the underlying operating system as well. So what we end up looking at is an uh, architecture that looks more like this, where we have a single distributed application that's running across multiple individual servers, and then we have a, a layer in between that does the scheduling and the management to provide the ser services that this application requires. So we start to think more in terms of service discovery and microservices and how they interact together, and then the underlying servers essentially become decoupled from that application. So we start to look at a framework and how we can incorporate this mindset and this me methodology. If we look at some examples of these sort of distributed applications, we've got the Twitters, the Instagrams, the Facebook. Within Cisco, we've got a number of these ourselves. So we've got things like Cisco Spark, the Meraki dashboard and everything. They're all running cloud native across, could be any cloud. Customers often ask Cisco, where does Meraki run? If we're running a Meraki you know, system at home or in a small office, where is that control plane running? The answer is we don't care. It's running in the cloud. It could be in Amazon, could be in Azure. It doesn't really matter. It could be an on-prem service that Cisco is offering, but th it's a cloud-scale application. Same thing with Instagram. You don't ever really question or query where does Instagram run? Does it run out of AWS? Does it run out of Azure? It doesn't matter because the application itself is now distributed across multiple instances or many servers. 
Now, the way that this is being achieved is through the use of microservices. So it becomes a shift in our mindset away from thinking of applications sitting on top of a single VM to the concept of a microservice. And the way that the microservices interact is through APIs. So the APIs become the glue that ties all this together. If we look at uh, a you know, typical example, we have a front-end service that is receiving queries either from a developer side or from a, a client request, and then it's talking down through APIs, down through a common communication logic that then talks to a back-end service. So we start to talk about, well, what is a microservice? And typically when we're talking microservices, these days we're talking containers. We're now also looking at serverless technology like Lambda or Fission, which is a, a method to provide the, the code running and executing at a container level so that it's spun up and runs a piece of code and then terminates itself. So the concept of a container is that it's fulfilling one function and doing it well and then it terminates itself. Now the nice thing with, <coughs> with the IT industry is that these are not new concepts. If we think back to the traditional Linux or Unix architecture, this is the same mindset, where we're in Linux world or Unix world, we have a single process that fulfills one function, does it very well, and then we combine multiple processes across, in that case it was a, a single bare metal host, to provide a full-blown operating system or a service. Now, same concept exists in the container world. The only difference is now is that we're dealing with a container that can span and talk across multiple environments, so we're no longer con constrained and confined to a single physical host. So a container gives us the ability to start to scale this out. Now the challenge that we face th at this point is that how do we manage the containers themselves? So the container architecture needs some sort of management system that sits on top of it. And what we've found is, is that um, Kubernetes has almost become the de facto standard that exists out there. But what the, we end up with is an ecosystem of container management products that allow the ability to manage and treat containers across multiple physical hosts and start to scale these applications out across web scale. So this is when we look at the AWS, the Azure, scaling these out across multiple geographic regions or across multiple physical hosts within a single data center or a multi-cloud methodology where we're going from a, a local data center where we can start to put rule sets that say, keep the local data, keep my actual database services running on-prem, maybe for governance reasons or for speed and reliability, but allow the front-end services to go out and burst out to cloud services. So we start to look at the container management and we start to get the benefits of the manageability across multiple containers and the flexibility and the portability where things like high availability and load balancing are effectively built into the container framework. So we start to be less concerned about how do we tie these things together because at the end of the day they're just APIs talking to other APIs. Now within OpenStack <coughs> there's the Magnum service. So Magnum is the project within OpenStack that starts to incorporate container services, be it Kubernetes or Docker Swarm, into an OpenStack environment. Now the other key thing to remember with containers is that typically they are absolutely stateless. The concept of a container is it spins up, executes some code or fulfills a function or a service and then it can be terminated. So we want them to be stateless. Now that brings a challenge with how do we actually start to manage the storage with these. So within the OpenStack framework, we have projects such as Manila, which allow us to store and retain and have stateful data that can persist across containers. So these are the fundamental things. How do we manage the containers? But then how do we get the data persistence? Because it's a waste of time if a customer logs into a shopping cart and then the next minute that shopping cart's been destroyed and that data is no longer stateful. So we need this methodology and we need these projects that sit within the OpenStack framework to have this stability of data. And what we, what we start to look at is, well, I don't really care what underlying storage platform is providing this capability. I need an API methodology in order to talk to it and start to save my data. And I don't really care too much if it's a traditional storage array or an Amazon S3 bucket or a hyperconverged product. What we want is a methodology through APIs to be able to save that data so that the containers themselves aren't tied to any physical location or tied to a particular type of storage. So this is the framework that we start to look at within OpenStack. Now, when we start to think about 
how do these devices talk together? We start to look at the networking. Now, Cisco being Cisco, this is what we've looked at from the container world, and we start to identify the challenges. Now, when we started to look at containers as when they were in their infancy, um, container communication was more or less restricted to a single host, where container to container traffic could not really pass between two different physical hosts without a lot of legwork down at the network level. So the methodology that we look at is, is that each individual container goes down through a bridge interface and then may go out unto, into an overlay network. Now the complexities started becoming very difficult to manage as we started to scale these out. The complexity of building that overlay network started to become a challenge. So we've seen a number of projects kick off to start to address this challenge. From the Cisco world, what we developed was an open source project called Contive. And I'd encourage you all to jump out, check it out, have a start to have a play with it, because what it is is a framework and a method where we can have a single policy definition where we define policy at a container level, and it gives us that ability to network and get our containers all talking together. So Contive is a, it's a Cisco developed framework and project, but it's available to the community. So you know, encourage everybody to jump on, check it out, and see what, what you can do with Contive. From the Contive side of things, we can connect to a traditional layer two or to a layer three VXLAN network or directly into the Cisco software defined networking product of ACI. So Contive is extremely flexible with how it can start to build out a wider container and wider networking ecosystem <coughs> to allow these microservices to communicate and talk together. Now, what we start to look at is instead of a monolithic application, we start to have these microservices. And it really is that evolution from the bare metal virtual and really start to decouple the application from the underlying infrastructure completely. So we start to really not care about the underlying virtual server or physical server. And what we have instead of this monolithic stack is this framework or mesh of services that all talk together. And Ultimately, what this will lead to is this ability for services to talk to other services and the east-west traffic to ultimately fulfill most of the requirements before sending it back to an end client. So in closing, what we sort of look at is this full framework. So the full stack tied together is the ability to have public APIs, which are the client method of interacting with the services or the front end of, of our application. And the user functionality is then driven through those front end APIs. And what we start to look at is a, a mindset where we don't really care too much what is interacting with that API, be it a web browser itself or a mobile device or a native actual you know, app on our phone or other sort of client. It's interacting through an API. And then on the client side, it determines how does that get pre presented to the user itself. And the same side of things, we have the developer access. So this is how the developers start to incorporate CICD and the process of updating and making changes to these internal services, but at the same time not kicking off and losing access for the end users. Within the application itself, we have API to API communications. Now what this leads to is, is the ability to decouple our front end and our back end services so that we can make changes and make upgrades to code at the back end services, be it a database or maybe some load balancing or a messaging bus, and then have the front end services act independently of this. Now on the Cisco side, what we've seen recently is the partnership with Google where we're going to be starting to incorporate ICO into a lot of these, this communication logic that sits within the middle. Now, as this, as this evolves, what we're going to see is the service discovery is going to become critical to these pieces. And what I mean by that is that ability for an end client to hit it with any device and be told automatically via the API what the best, best methodology is based on that client device. So if a web browser hits it, the response would come, is going to effectively tell it to use HTTP to communicate with it. If it comes through a mobile device, we might switch to a different protocol. On the internal side, we start to decouple again. You know, am I using an FTP methodology to connect to that backend service or HTTP or some other methodology? And the service discovery, that communication logic within the middle is gonna become the glue that ties all this together. So this is what we start to look at for a modern application design. Now, what I'd encourage you all to check out is a website called the 12 Factor Application 
because it starts to incorporate a lot of these ideas and starts to put this framework around how do we build our applications. Now, that's essentially it. This was a lightning talk, so I hope that's given you a lot of food for thought. Um, come and have a chat with us over at the stand or come and see me afterwards if you've got any deeper dive questions. But yeah, real quick lightning talk. Hope it was beneficial and yeah, hope everybody has a good evening on whatever event they've got planned with um, maybe on a cruise or whatever they've got planned for the evening. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.